Let's say we take a break from making cool line art. Fire up Google Image Search and just look at cool renders online. Just kidding. I lied. We can't stop making cool line art renders. We are now moving beyond advanced, entering the freestyle cult realm even. And guess what? You're not just going to be pros, but masters in the art of line drawing. And who knew that line drawing could be so hardcore? I say now, epically welcome to the cult of freestyle. With that weird intro out of the way, what we're going to look at is line style geometry modifiers. They have weird names and are easy to get confused. But being more than just the masters here, we have some cheat codes to make understanding them faster. There are five main categories of geometry modifiers, but you really only need to remember four categories because one of them will always be there. The first is what we called a base modifier. This has only one modifier number, which is sampling. You must have one of these modifiers in the geometry tab at all time. The next line is transform category. They do basic transforms like translate, rotate, and scale lines. Meanwhile, stroke length category will extend or remove stroke length. Next, the noise category is about adding noise to the strokes. There are three of those modifiers, two of them being a Perlin noise type. The final category of modifiers are those which abstractly change strokes. They are neither noise nor basic transforms. They can make a straight line curve, a curve into a blocky segment, or even extend strokes into weird shapes. And for the example, we'll examine how each geometry modifier will modify our lines. This example has two models. The first is this, well, not so a default cube, but a more complex model of a grandfather clock. Before we go deep, it's best that I explain one important point. Geometry modifiers rely heavily on stroke chaining. Chaining means that you either want longer strokes or shorter ones. Either you chain it or you break the chain. Breaking the chain, your stroke will be shorter and the modifier will apply changes to each of the shorter strokes. Next is the chaining type. We have seen this in an earlier stage, but we only looked at plain chaining. This time we'll look at sketchy chaining too. By default, it has a chaining of three rounds, which means the stroke will be drawn three times back and forth. If you don't have any geometry modifiers other than the sampling activated, it is pointless to activate the sketchy chaining type. The lines will simply draw over each other. Sketchy is useful when your lines are displaced. With three rounds, you'll add slightly displaced strokes on top of the previous ones, which will create many kinds of effects. We'll look at how each modifier behaves with sketchy chaining. Let's start with the sampling modifier. As I said before, this modifier must be on at all times. It is used by subsequent geometry modifiers, so don't ever remove it. And hey, it has only one parameter, sampling. But what is sampling? What unit does it have? As with most geometry modifiers, every calculation is done in pixels. Which if you think about it, geometry, pixels? Weird, huh? Why isn't it the size or a parameter of the object? The answer is simple. Since freestyle is a post-process that renders lines, all calculations of the view map are screen space. That means everything is in pixels. If you do a 2D transform or displacement on a raster image, they are done in pixels. That means your render size matters. Returning to the first question, what is sampling? First, we know it is in pixels. Second, and very important, small sampling means more precise, which also means your curve and the details will be easier to see, less blocky. But the downside is that it will take longer to calculate, hence longer renders, but not by too much. There are a few geometry modifiers that need sampling to be smaller than the default of 10 pixels. Unless you're going from a cultist to a fanatic, of course. They are those which make curves, like those in the noise and the abstract category. Which are, that's your homework, clue. Look at the concept screen. The next modifier is 2D offset. This modifier shifts the lines in relative to the XY direction and or normal direction. This top part is for normal displacement. To make it clear, let's play with the value. First, using plane chaining. At 100% resolution, start at 5. This is offset 5 pixels in the normal direction at the beginning of the stroke. And see here, they move 5 pixels away. And at 20, we'll shift the end of the stroke 20 pixels in the normal direction. Everything between is interpolated. Now we try sketchy chaining. You can see the lines look a little crazy now, but if you observe carefully, there are three strokes. With chaining back to plane, we examine the bottom two parameters of the 2D offset modifier. Zero off the top two values, X and Y is moving the whole stroke X and Y in pixels. 
Let's try x equals 5, y equals 10. Now you can see the whole stroke moves 5 pixels in the x direction and 10 pixels in the y direction. If we combine everything, the result will be very interesting. Let me just whip something up. And if you turn off solid render, this will look a little like a sketch. Extremely expressive. Nice, huh? The 2D transform modifier scales and or rotates your strokes based on pivot type. There are five types of pivot. Stroke center is pivot at the median point of the stroke. But don't mistake median for middle of the line. If the line curves, the median will be off the line and be somewhere towards the inside of the curve. Stroke start is simple. It's the beginning point of the stroke. Stroke end, also simple. It's the end of the stroke. Stroke point parameter. This is a relative length along the actual stroke. Zero means the start point and one is the end point. You can set it between this range. Absolute 2D pivot point. Pivot X and pivot Y define the position of the pivot point in the final render. The origin, or coordinate 0, 0, is at the bottom left corner. This pivot is dependent on your render size. Your absolute render size will change your pivot location. So if you set it to X equals 200 and Y equals 200 in a 720p render, when you resize the image to 1080p, the render will look different, so be mindful of that. For example, we will use the stroke point parameter as a pivot, set as 0.3. This means the pivot will be at 30% of each stroke length. Scale X and Y both at 0.8. That means we shrink the strokes and set a rotation of 45 degrees. If you observe the cube, the strokes rotate at 30 degrees, they shrink 20%, not really sure whether to call it nice or meh. When do you use this modifier? Frankly, I'm not very sure. But I'm sure some of you might find this useful for a musical visualization driver. Oh man, I just gave him another hint. Well, there's no turning back now, I just put it in your mind. I hope it doesn't keep you awake at night. The next geometry modifier is Backbone Stretcher. No, this isn't a torture device, nor will it maim your rendered strokes. Backbone is simply another name for stroke. The stretcher part means it extends your stroke. Turn chaining off to get extensions in more areas. The Bezier curve modifier introduces errors to the stroke, making it smooth. Strange, but it works. The smoothness of the line is based on the maximum error distance compared to the unmodified stroke. A small error means a small distance, less smoothing, and it would be almost unmodified. A large error means a big distance equal to big smoothing and more line abstraction. No, sketchy chaining of Bezier curve can be stylish too. Bezier curve is a good friend of suggestive contour, and that's a tip from me to you. Next, blueprint modifier. This is the weirdest yet one of the awesomest modifiers of them all. Side note, yes, I love making up non-existent descriptive words. It produces interesting blueprint-like strokes using either circular, elliptical, or square contours. Use it to capture silhouette, construction lines, and more. The and more part will be shown later as a tip. Rounds is how many times the stroke is repeated, just like that of the sketchy option in chaining. For circles and ellipses, they have two similar options. Random radius is used to randomize the radius size, and random center is used to randomize the center of the circle or ellipse. Tip time! With chaining off, the circle or ellipse part of this modifier creates curvy strokes. The fun part is with chaining on and split by 2D lengths. Use a small value for length and you'll make fluffy lines. If you simply can't bear to wait, pause the video, model yourself a little teddy bear, and add this line style. Let's move on to the final option, squares. Squares, on the other hand, will draw square lines surrounding the stroke area. Backbone length will stretch or extend each stroke. Random backbone will randomize the sketching by the amount of pixels given. If you follow the previous tip, you'll get a spiky line, and we'll leave that for you to experiment with. Moving along to the next modifier, guiding lines will replace strokes with a straight line from a start point directly to the end of the stroke. This offset option shifts the start and end points along the original stroke, and then generates a new straight line. The result is sometimes weird. To get the best results with this, 2D length splitting is needed. Sketchy with three or more rounds too. Let's make a quick one. With an offset of 1, a 2D length splitting of 100, and sketchy chaining with a round of 5. Render! It sort of looks like a rough sketch. With thickness along stroke modifier, this will look even more organic. 
intermission time. Well, are you line crazy yet? I did say that this stage is a bit cult-like, so take a deep breath and let's continue. And now for Perlin Noise 1D and 2D. First, a little background. Perlin Noise was created by Ken Perlin to create random noise that looks natural, as in not spiky or harsh, by layering noises and interpolating them into multiple levels called octaves. You can find a very detailed description of Perlin Noise with the link in the notes. It's a fun read if you're a noise nerd like Mr. Light. We have 1D and 2D Perlin Noise. They have the same settings. Now remember the layout of these settings because we're about to switch to concept view. Done! This is sort of our shortcut to understanding the Perlin Noise settings. Frequency is how dense the noise is, scaling along the stroke. Increased frequency means the noise gets denser. Amplitude is how much the noise distorts the stroke in the angled direction. Increased amplitude will make the noise higher in the angled direction. Octaves are noise layers. More octaves means more details, but you won't need too many. Low octaves will lead to jaggy noise. Higher octaves will make the noise smoother. To get the best result with octaves, you'll need to lower sampling to 3 or 1 pixels or so, because you won't see more details without better sampling. Now back to freestyle, with two more settings. Angle is in which direction the noise is applied, 0 degrees being horizontal. Seed is a random generator. The same seed over a stroke will always give the same result. Now back to the example. So what are the differences of 1D and 2D? Let's render it out to see. We set both of them to the same settings. We'll use render slot 1 for Perlin Noise 1D and slot 2 for Perlin Noise 2D. Comparing the two render slots, we can see that Perlin Noise 1D with the same settings is just not as noisy as Perlin Noise 2D. 1D has less noise, 2D has more noise, and that's about it. But wait, what if we do line length splitting? Pause the video, because this would be kind of cool to try. Try it with a chain length splitting of, say, 50 pixels. Done with experimenting? If you did, congratulations. Freestyle has many gems, but only to be discovered by those who seek them out. Well, time to move on to the next modifier. Polygonization. This simplifies strokes making smooth strokes into jaggy straight lines. Like Bezier curve, it has only one parameter, which is error. Small error, like 1, will lessen the polygonal error. A big error value, like 50, will make the line rendering almost abstract. This is a simple modifier, so I'll let you experiment with the different error values. Sinus displacement is our next modifier. Sinus displacement is nice, but quite tricky to get working. It adds wavy sinusoidal displacements to strokes. It has almost the same settings as Perlin noise. Longer wavelength means a bigger sinus wave. Amplitude is the maximum amount of displacement in the tangent direction. Phase is the phase offset for the sinus strokes. With the default sampling of 10, the result will be a sawtooth wave, which is not what we want. But if sawtooth is what you want, then default sampling value is for you. To get it to render smooth sine wave lines, we need to lower sampling. At sampling of four, you'll start seeing sinus lines. At sampling of 2, you'll see almost perfect sinus lines. And you can go to sampling 1, but that could be overkill as the render time will shoot up in a complex model. A tip! Animating the phase will make sinus waves move, like the wiggly lines on a ghost character. That's another thing you can try. Spatial noise is our third noise modifier after the two Perlin noise modifiers. It adds spatial noise to strokes. What is spatial noise? We'll answer that a little later, but first let's look at the settings. Amplitude is how much the noise distorts the stroke. Scale is the width of noise along the stroke. A big number equals longer straight lines, which are smoother, and a small number means shorter straight lines, which are noisy. Octaves are the level of detail of the noise, just like in Perlin noise, but changing the octave doesn't change the detail of noise that much. You might need to change sampling more than the octaves for this one. Smooth. When this is enabled, it applies smoothing over the generated noise, making it less blocky. Pure random. If this is enabled, it will generate a random noise each time you render it and on each frame. When it's disabled, the next generated random value depends on the previous one. This is used to create temporal coherence between frames. In short, disabling this setting provides a more consistent noise along the stroke. And now for an example. Our end goal here is to get tiny noisy strokes. With the sampling of 10, the noise will be jaggy. 
To get smoother lines, we need to lower the sampling to around 2. To get tiny noisy strokes, the amplitude and scale need to be lower. I'm thinking 2 for both, and the default octaves of 4 is just fine. Now isn't that nice? It's like the poor grandpa clock is freezing in a cold room. If you are animating, you may want to disable pure random as the previous stated reason. Now back to the question, what is spatial noise? Defining it alone is hard, so we need to compare. In TK's own words, the difference is in the way how the displacement is added. In the spatial noise geometry modifier, the displacement direction at each stroke vertex is perpendicular to the tangent of the curve at the vertex. In the Perlin noise geometry modifiers, the displacement direction is uniform and given by the angle parameter. Well, that's a little hard to understand, right? But there's help. In short, he sketched this. Perlin noise displaces in the direction specified by the angle parameter. Spatial noise displaces strokes in the normal direction to the stroke. And with that, we can see the definition of spatial noise. Well, here we are at our last geometry modifier, which is hooray and sad. Hooray for no more technical parts specific to freestyle. And sad for no more technical parts specific to freestyle. Ambivalence. That emotion is rather complex and quite confusing too. Well, as not to over-dramatize the emotional state, let's move on. Tip remover removes or shrinks the length of strokes at both ends by the amount of pixels specified by tip length. Note. The start and end of each stroke is controlled by chaining. Another note, tip length only works with positive values. Again, sampling will define the accuracy of the length removed. At default of 10, the tip remover is generally not accurate. Try lowering it. Now let's try to remove 5 pixels of each stroke tip. Turn chaining off, tip length to 5, sampling to 1. Tip remover is actually an excellent way to find where the line chaining breaks. With that, we are done. But one thing needs to be clarified. Unlike color, alpha, and thickness modifiers, none of the line style geometry modifiers have an influence slider, which means it works just like object modifiers, stacked from top to bottom. As in, one effect is building up from the other. With that being said, even sampling can be used more than once. You can keep sample at its default, apply a couple modifiers, then you can resample, but only at a lower value, and apply other modifiers. This can be useful for some of the more abstract and noisy modifiers, like this. Oh, one more thing. Let's do something fun. Let's make some balls bounce. Uh, well that might get a bit awkward. Anyway, it's fairly elemental for demonstrating a fun freestyle feature. First, watch the mundane ball bounce. Everyone's seen that, right? I even nearly fell asleep halfway through that. Imagine watching a longer version. Actually, that might be a good sleep therapy for some insomniac blender heads, which can't stop spinning. Now let's add some shading, a basic shadow, and our freestyle lines. It's getting a little better, but what if we really want to stretch or squash or mash the tuneness of our ball bouncing? Well, as with many pieces of data, we can actually animate the values of our line styles. One such value, on the spatial noise modifier, well, actually there's three big variables in there. When our ball hits the ground, we can actually make our line style modifier interact on impact. So here's what the video looks like. Blammo! Isn't that nice? And now the how. The bouncing ball has predictable curves from an animation standpoint. See my curves? We can easily line up when we want the noise to kick in on the same points where the ball impacts on the ground. To do that, advance the frame to where the ball first hits the ground. Set the value of the noise to zero amplitude. Hover over the value and press I to insert a keyframe. Then advance a few frames and set the value of amplitude to say 10. Hover, set another keyframe. Of course, there are many ways of doing this, and for me, the easiest way is to simply add frames in the F-curve editor directly at this point. It's sort of like drawing the action, I suppose. Also note that pure random is turned off. That makes the noise of the line stay coherent to the previous frame. And that is how we make an emotionally disturbed freestyle line on impact. We have reached the end of this stage. FYI, this stage took us over two months to plan and write. There were many back and forth correspondences with Tamito to fix and iron out the corner cases which were missed by most freestyle users. This is sort of like patting ourselves on the back between Mr. Light, Tamito-san, and myself. You guys, those bugs were pawned and owned. Final words of this stage, to be masters of freestyle, be the wizard of geometry modifier.